Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the, the real Robin Bradley Bombs. is dropping. What it is, Brad Lee back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs today in the studio, folks. Do I got a treat for you? If you're into sales or closing and you really wanted to know how to excel your game, man, you guys got to pay attention to today's episode. I've got Jonathan Dawson from Cellcology in the studio. Welcome, Jonathan. Brad, pleasure to be here, honored to be here, excited to be here. Man, I'm excited to have you because I always tell people, you know, there's a lot of sales training out there that just gives you the basics. There's nothing magical about it. It works because it's blocking and tackling. But when you start to elevate and get deep into the sales game, words matter, psychology matters, and you have cellcology, which is kind of a mixture of words and selling. Yeah, I mean, that's actually, the, the name Cellcology came basically from one of my clients who was trying to describe what I did before I even had the branding of Cellcology. They were trying to describe to uh, to actually a prospect who I was talking to. My client was standing there, and, and I said, look, I could tell this guy what I do. Why don't you tell him what I do? And he kept saying, look, it's a totally different way of looking at the sale. It's 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 psychology. It's selling. It's It's selling and psychology. It's it's selling, it's psychology, you know, it's, it's, it's what it is. And I, I woke up that night, like literally one in the morning, woke up and I checked GoDaddy and I'm like, psychology, it's available. And then I'm like, I locked it all down. I'm like, oh my God, that, that is what I do. I just didn't have the name. Uh, but yeah, it's selling through psychology. You know, every sales transaction, you know, they say it's not what you say, but how you say it. And I would add a layer to that. I'd say it's how the customer feels when you say it. It's not just what you say and how you say it. It's how a person receives it that matters. Mm, that's a bomb. Yes, indeedy, folks. And what you're on a mission, you're on a mission to save the world one salesperson at a time. That's right. You just want to make everybody better. Yeah, I, I, I uh, have a very um, deep emotional connection to my mission. I want to save the world one salesperson at a time. I want salespeople to go home and look at their spouses or their kids and feel like the time they spent away from them uh, was a good exchange. You know, a lot of times a salesperson, we put in a lot of hours. We, we deal with a lot of nonsense. But, you know, we're away from the people that we love most in the world, and we owe those people a return on that investment. And I want every great salesperson to be able to go home, look their family in the eyes, and know I, I exchanged time and I got a good return. Yeah, you know, I was saying on the podcast the other day, the wealthy mindset is to trade money for time and kind of the people say poor mindset i don't really agree with it's a poor mindset that's just an uneducated mindset they trade time for money Mm -hmm. and i grew up in the sales business as you know and man you put in some hours Mm -hmm. so i 100 percent agree that if you're gonna have to put in those hours you better come home with a fat paycheck absolutely and a lot of salespeople are putting in the hours but they're not coming home with a paycheck Mm -hmm. or they're coming home with a puny one Mm -hmm. So not only do they get beat up all day by customers, their managers, other salespeople trying to spin them off, you know, then they come home and they get, you know, badgered by their family about what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you gone all the time? And we still ain't raised up at all. Right. So, so if, if I were in the game back in the day, you, you weren't even around back in my day. How old are you? I'm 41 now. See, I got underwear older than you. (laughs) You probably still have the underwear. I do. Um, but, but you know, you don't hear a lot of the content that you have, dude. That's what that's why I like old Jonathan Dawson's content. Because, man, when you listen to it, even when you're a pro like me, and I, I would definitely say I'm a pro, um, you know, it's good. You can't argue with it. But more importantly, it's good information that you wouldn't have heard out in just the normal world. I appreciate it. And I think it's because what you just did a ton of reading or, well, it's a combination of things. I mean, I definitely have the school of hard knocks. You know, I got started in sales at uh, 17 as a door to door salesperson recruited by the elder of my church. He had uh, had a vision from God, so to speak. He came to me one day at church and said, um, one day, every home in America will have digital programming. And I said, I don't know what that means. And he said, well, you know, a DVD player, right? And I said, yes. He said, one day, every home in America will have a DVD player. 
And I said, that's not possible. They're like $500. There's no way every home will have one. And I was just a little kid. And, and uh, But he got me recruited to go sell Dish Network door-to-door at 17 years old. He said, just do it when you can. And uh, that's how I got started selling. And uh, real quick, what I was really good at, and I'm grateful for this uh, the skill set, is I'm really good at finding patterns. And I find that you know the old expression is success leaves clues. And what I realized was that I would knock on somebody's door and uh, depending on actually, what was interesting was depending on how they responded to the first knock, I started to pick up on a pattern that how they respond to the knock would determine how the sale would likely go. And uh, I'll give you a quick example of that, that that helped me then throughout the rest of my sales career. This one thing I learned at 17. When you knock on somebody's door, the way they respond to the knock is, uh, if you want to call it a tiered system of reaction to someone knocking on their door. So for example, you'll have some people that are open and totally receptive to, to, to the knock. And they literally open the door and you can see right through the house, out into the backyard, through the window. Well, that person's going to be very receptive to anything you say because they have a very open personality, if you will, or open receptive nature. And then you have the contrast of the right. The total opposite of that is you knock on the door and they literally pretend they're not home, right? So you have this, this spectrum. You have the people who you knock and they pretend they're not home. You have the people who knock and then they come check through the blinds or the peephole to see who's there, but they don't, they don't speak. You have the people who talk through a door. You have the people who crack the door open, but there's a chain or they're blocking with their foot. And then you have the other one, which... Uh, opens the door, but they frame the door with their body so, so you can't see inside the house yet. Each of those people actually responded completely different to my initial pitch. So what I discovered was that that if I was going to have more success with each of them, I had to tailor my pitch to each of those people. And what I found was that I had a slightly different opener and pitch to the person who opened the door than I did to the person who you know pretended they weren't home. And uh, adapting my process by finding these patterns within the sale uh, allowed me to customize my approach and 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 obviously increase my sales and, and my profits. Hmm. So so at what time did you decide you're going to start teaching? Well, actually, interestingly enough, so at that at that particular company um, for the satellite company, I became the number one salesman of the company. We had one salesperson, and I was the number one salesperson. And shortly after that, uh, we hired a second salesperson. I I stayed the, the number one. We had our third, we had our fourth, and eventually we had 60 uh, plus sales reps in five states for this one little company. And uh, I was 18 years old, and because I had the most seniority and the most success, I became the trainer effectively. So I I started teaching people how to sell door-to-door at uh, 17, 18 years old as I was, at that time, the best salesman in the company. Uh, eventually I got in the car business at 22 where I started selling cars. Uh, I got, uh, out of the car business, uh, retail site at 24. I got, uh, uh, an opportunity to get into training at 24 years old with another training company. And I worked with them for about a year and a half, um, and set and broke all the records in that company. And then shortly after that, I realized that my style and approach was, was so unique that I, I needed to have my own, uh, my own company. And so that's when I started, uh, sell college. And, and, uh, that was what year? Well, that would be 17 years ago. So you've been around 17 years? 17 years ago. I've been, I've been I got in real, I actually just three days ago, I had my 19 year anniversary of my very first car sale was 19 years ago, three days ago. And, uh, so then two years after that, I started doing training. And so psychology was, I guess, 15 years old, but I've been doing training in automotive space for 17. Yeah. But that's, man, that's a quite a, quite a, quite a time. Yeah, man. I'm an overnight success, 17 years in the making. Yeah. <laughs> so another couple of years, dude, you're going to be accused of like basically striking it rich overnight. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what everybody thinks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what would you say, like dropping bombs? I don't know if you listen to it because I know that you uh, are busy most of the time, but what we do is we sit here and shoot the shit a little bit and yeah. figure out like, what are some things that most people are facing? And then we discuss what maybe we would have done or yeah. what we would do to get past it. So out in the world right now, in the world of sales, still doing cars and you, you go outside of car business now, but in the car business or any business, what are you seeing as a big issue with salespeople? Well, I think uh, generating their own traffic or their own ability to create uh, their own book of business is by far the number one skill set that I get asked about uh, the most. And, um, so in my in my space, what I try to do for for sales teams is not just teach them you know how to generate traffic in a generic sense, but how to generate that targeted traffic that's that's their highest quality opportunity. Um, when I'm talking to a sales team uh, at the dealership, for example, I, I'll say you know imagine a car pulls up on the lot and it's got five bumper stickers on the back 
okay? What would those five bumper stickers need to say or look like? What would they need to have on the car that if you saw those, you'd be like, that's a done deal because if they have that bumper sticker, I'm going to sell them something, right? And everybody can think of what that, what that would look like if it could be, if you have a Marine's background or if there's a you know, license plate bracket that says I'd rather be fishing and you're a fisherman. But you could basically, through that analogy, you could say, if I could identify my ideal target, best possible prospect, what would that look like? And then it's really teaching salespeople that those people exist and that you don't have to go through the randomness of opportunities to sell somebody. You can begin to create a following, create a target audience, create the people that you would do best with, work best with, that would be your ideal client, and uh, attract those people and do it through content marketing, but do it through referrals, do it through lead generation, um, target marketing uh, through obviously uh, campaigns and Facebooks. You can do all those things. But do not make yourself a victim of the randomness of the market. It's too much work, and there's no uh, no good reason to make that your business model. So generating their own traffic? Yeah, that's huge. I mean, because if you could, like theoretically, if instead of, let's t- say, talking to 50 random people and dealing with your average close ratio, if you had, you know, the same 50 people, but they were your ideal target prospects, if they... If they had three to five commonalities with you, um, whether it be hobbies, interests, or, or experiences or people that they knew, your close ratio doesn't just double. It gets astronomical. You might have a 90% close ratio on those 50 people instead of a 20%. So on financial s- s- uh, side of things, that's it's the smartest way to build a business is to build it around raving fan advocates, people that would naturally want to do business with you anyway. So if I'm a business and I've got a team of salespeople and they're standing around taking you know, traffic that's coming in the door, what are some of the things that they can do to generate their own traffic as individuals? So the most practical and basic thing anybody can do better is to work for the referral uh, of the people that you enjoyed selling the most. So if you have an ideal client, like if you sell somebody and you have a wonderful experience, you need to leverage that experience. See, wealthy people understand this. And I think, Brad, you probably better than most people understand the importance of creating multiple streams of passive residual income. Right, that's a wealth principle, period. So in sales, the equivalent of that is taking uh, an ideal customer and creating multiple streams of them uh, and having them passively se- send other friends and family in to see you. So the referral is the first thing that you do. And when it comes to referrals, I think that there's a, a series of mistakes I think people typically make when it comes to referrals, uh, e- even in the way they execute. And uh, if you don't mind, can I get into the, some minutia here, get into the, the specifics? Okay. So generally speaking, when you, whenever anybody's ever asked for referrals, they typically ask for a referral of, the, of a sale. So they'll say something like, by the way, loved working with you. If you know anyone else that wants to buy a mattress or if you know anyone else that wants to buy some furniture, let me know. Or in the car business, if you want, nobody else wants to buy a car, let me know. A uh, problem is that's a transactional request, and at the time that you ask it, the person you're asking probably doesn't know who out of their entire sphere of influence would possibly be in the market for that. So instead, I, I flip the script, which I know that's a term you like to use. I flip the script. So what I do is I say, listen, I'm not interested in, in who you know that wants to buy X. I'm interested in who you know that would like me and would want to work with me if they're ever in the market for X, period. So I'm looking for introductions and endorsements. I'm not looking for another sale because I'm looking to expand my network into the people that would naturally like me and want to work with me anyway. So my questions, I teach a, a technique, I, I call it sometimes, I refer to it as the four question technique, but it's a really simple stair-stepped sequence of questions that set up the expectation that the customer is going to send you the, the, your ideal prospect. The four questions go like this, they're very simple. Uh, based on your experience working with me today, if you had any friends or family that were ever in the market for a service or product like mine, would you feel comfortable recommending and endorsing me to them? And of course, the customer should say yes. The following question, uh, out of everyone that you know, how many of them do you think would actually like me in the way that I do business? If they could work with somebody like me, how many, how many people do you know that you think would like me? They're probably going to say everybody. The third question, based on that, could I ask you for a personal favor, a way that you could help me out? And they should say yes. And you get to the fourth question, would you be willing to introduce and endorse me to those people that you think would like me and my services if I could show you how? And at that point, people say yes. It's a simple stair step. In, in psychology, it's, it's using a couple of principles, the commitment principle of, of micro agreements. It's using the principle of liking and, so, and reciprocity. So it's creating in the mind of the consumer who's, who's hearing these questions. They're going, yeah, how, okay, how do I do this? Let me, let, me, let me help you. So those four questions lead it up. Now, the execution in the next part is really simple. It's really what kind of introduction do you want? So 
I teach some of my students to get at that point a video endorsement and introduction that can be used on social media. So one way would be for me to say, you know, Brad, if you feel that way, what I'd love to do is catch a, a quick video introduction of you and me to your friends and family, just anybody who might see the video that they could uh, they, they they could see that you you endorse and trust me. I'd love to get a video testimonial with you. At which point we shoot a video. Another method might be to grab a photo with you if I want something less intrusive. Well, let's say you and I are going to do photo, and then maybe I'm going to have that photo put on social media, or you're going to put it on your social media and tag and say, hey, I just met so-and-so and they did a great job. And you should work with them. <coughs> so maybe it's that. Another way could, to do it might be to actually ask for and actually solicit an actual list of referrals, of introductions. Um, my students, uh, I actually personally, I, I, think, I think it's fair to say we hold records in this area. We have more referrals given to my salespeople than I think any, anybody in the history of, of the industry. Like I have students who literally will get the transfer of a customer's phone contacts sent literally sending their entire contact list to a car salesman. I mean, can you imagine what's happening? I mean, like a customer buys a car and then transfers their contact list and says, here's all of my friends and family. That's ultimate control. Right there. Yeah, I would say it's ultimate uh, advocacy is the word that I use. Because, you know, when I ask, like, what, what needs to be in place for a customer to trust you at that level, it's not enough that they trust you or like you. They actually need to have advocacy. Advocacy is the highest form or value of a relationship in sales. Because I might like you and want to have a beer with you, but that doesn't mean I want to get into my financials. I might trust you and be willing to get into my financials, but I don't want to hang out with you because I don't like you. An advocate is someone who will in endure personal injury on behalf of you. A, an advocate is someone who will risk something for you. What you want is advocates. You don't want customers. You don't want clients. You don't even want happy customers. You want advocates because if you have an advocate, that's a person saying, I'm willing to take on risk because I believe in your cause so much. So, hmm. so that's really ultimately what I teach sales is I teach salespeople not simply how to sell, how to transact with somebody, how to gain the sale or the money, but how to do so in such a way that it causes the person to become your advocate in the marketplace. And that's one way that you, that you do it. Yeah, well, that's a great word. I'm going to have to look up the definition. Are you saying that, and I know you, because you're word smither, advocate means someone that'll risk injury for you? Yeah, an advocate is somebody who will um, become not only your promoter, but like I said, um, will take on uh, your cause. You know, so like when you think of like, in society right now, look at like in media or whatever, when you see somebody who's an advocate for a political candidate or a political cause, they literally march in the streets. They block traffic. If they take it to the extreme, they literally vandalize places or, or hit other people who disagree with them. You want a client who, after they buy from you, if they find out their mother doesn't buy from you, that, that your client unfriends their mother. That's what you want. So how do you get that kind of established rapport so it, it is a it is rapport is a foundational ingredient it must be there it's a it's a core it's a if you want to say it, it's an essential but not sufficient ingredient so it's essential that you have the rapport which is the connection where the person feels a connection with you but it's not um it's not uh sufficient you it wouldn't be enough you have to have massive trust too so it's the combination of them, right? It's like, if I like you a lot, but I don't trust you, I won't advocate for your cause. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's when you take liking and trusting to their apex in the emotional experience of the buying that the customer then switches over and becomes an advocate. But it also requires that you ask them to enter into that relationship with you. See, an advocate has to, like I said, has to, has to, there has to be a cost associated with advocacy. So you have to give a person the chance to take on risk. When I say to you, for example, I want to do a video with you that we're going to send all your friends and family. Now you're taking on risk. If I say to you, give me 10 names out of your phone that you think would like me that if I reached out to them and introduced myself. Uh, and I'll use the example I mentioned earlier, which is in the car business, because that's my area that I spend most of my energy in. But if I just sold you a car and I say, hey, listen, well, here's what I need. I need you to bust out your phone. I'm creating a cool people club. I just need you to roll through A through Z and just write down the names of people that you think these are cool people. If they were ever going to buy a car, they'd like to work with you. And just start hitting that list and write down names and numbers. Then I'm going to send them the video you and I are about to create. We're going to create a video where you're introducing and endorsing me, as you just said. And I'm going to send that video to them as a link. And it's going to be a way of introducing myself to your friends and family and expanding my network. If you're willing to do that, you're an advocate. You know, I have, I have students who actually have like yard signs made up that go by the driveway that say that shiny new car in my driveway came from. And customers are taking home the new car and putting yard signs up that say, hey, you like this car, go get your own. I mean, these are advocates, people who will go on social media and say, hey, I just bought a car from 
you know, you need to create that. Stop in, in selling, stop trying to get somebody to do business and start trying to create advocates. You might have 10, 15, 20 sales in a month, whatever your industry is standard. You might have that much volume of business, but it's not the quantity, it's the quality. And that's where, if you think that way, qualitative thinking instead of quantitative, not just how many people did I sell, how many advocates did I create? Mm. So you flipped the script. I've got my own version of that. But what I did, and it was kind of unique, you know, I taught a lot of people to do it. Um, only a few did it, which is weird. Because again, you can teach people all kinds of successful techniques and a lot of them just you know discount it or never try it and just yeah. end up selling nothing and getting out of the business however my flip the script was see when most people ask for referrals it's like you know anybody that wants to buy anything right so i would say listen i'm trying to get promoted which yeah. was the truth that's right and um i need to fill up our inventory so yeah. what i'd like you to do if you would is write down five names and numbers of close friends and family where I can call and buy their car. That's right. And if I buy their car, I'd be happy to send you to dinner or you know, yeah. send you a bird dog right, or whatever. Right. So I, I never really got any pushback because I went from a seller right. to a buyer. That's and, right. and people don't want a salesman calling their friends and family because then their friends and family will be like, hey, Dick, why'd you give out my phone number right. to this pushy salesman? So if you are creating an advocate, you just get even normal referrals you'll get more of because they're an advocate. Right. But if, if, if you want to try this one, folks, pay attention. You go from a seller to a buyer. Because like if you said, Brad, I, I, I'm in the market for houses and I don't care if they're in the market because I'm going to knock on their door and I'm going to offer them top dollar for their home. Right. But I only want to help out those people that you really care about. So write down five names and numbers of somebody that you really like because I'm going to yeah. offer them top dollar. Dude, I, I'd write down my friends because you're going to go buy their house. That's right. No one's going to be mad at me for sending someone over to give them too much money for their house. That's right. So I'd say, do you know anybody that wants to sell their car? I mean... Uh, what they're driving and I'm going to try and buy it. Not, do you know anybody that wants to sell it? Cause the answer might be no, not, not really. I don't anybody, but I want to buy it. Yeah. I want to buy cars. I'm trying to get promoted here. So do yeah. me a favor, write down five names and numbers, right? Tell me what kind of car they drive. And if I buy it, I'll give you a bird dog. Dude, I used to get referral after referral, after yeah. referral, after referral. So think about it. If I'm selling 30 cars and I'm getting five each, that's 150 leads. Yeah. 150 leads. And yeah. then when you call those leads, listen, Jonathan was just in here buy, buying a car. Right. He told me you're driving a 2007 Honda Accord. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Would you be interested in selling that car if I could give you top dollar? There you go. And they're like, absolutely. Uh, well, what's top dollar? Right. Sometimes they'd say, nope, not interested. Yeah. That's my, okay. My, my brother gave it to me. I'm never selling it. I right. love it. But nine times out of 10, they'd say, yeah, what's top dollar? Mm -hmm. I'd say, well, obviously I'd have to take a look at it because I don't know the condition of it. Can you... Can, Describe it to me a little bit. Yeah, it's automatic. Air right. blows cold. Everything's great. Well, again, I, I I'd hate to put a number in your yeah. head and then not be able to match that. So when can you come? And let me take a look at it. So it's interesting about that. So what you did there that I think also made it work is when you when you did uh, raising it to a higher level meaning or purpose. See, I think another mistake that salespeople make is that they make everything again transactional and they don't elevate things to a higher meaning, purpose, or cause. You said, I'm trying to get promoted. You see, when you say to somebody, I have I have this thing I'm asking you to do and here's the meaning behind it, the purpose. There's a calling behind it. It elevates the person's desire to be part of it. People wanna be part of something bigger than they are. If I just say, hey, uh, would you do this? Your, your reaction to would you do this, a request, would you write down five names, will be totally different than when you assign a meaning to it. I'm trying to get promoted, would you do this for that cause? People want to be part of causes, you see? And the more a person is part of a cause, the more they ingrain themselves as an advocate of that cause. So that was part of the psychology of what made what your, your technique work as well, was not only flipping the script and becoming the buyer, but letting people know there was a purpose behind it that they could be part of a purpose. And I think like, uh, so my students, by the way, I mean, I agree with you, getting five is awesome. My students get regularly 50, 100 names and numbers, like literally people transfer their entire phone books. Uh, some of my students, I had one salesperson sold a car. The lady sat down for two and a half hours after the purchase, wrote down 500 names and numbers out of her phone, handwritten. But out of curiosity, why would you want them all if they're not interested? Because, because again, remember the goal here is not looking for the buyer. I'm not looking for the buyer. I'm looking for people who would like me. Remember, the goal is that when I meet somebody who is my ideal customer, that, that we understand the nature of 
friendships and how friendships typically work, that people align themselves with people who are similar, right? The birds of a feather flock together. So if I could get my name introduced to 500 people who are just like you, if I, if I got your phone opened up right now and I, I could get myself introduced to 500 people in your phone, that would be huge for my business, right? Whether or not they're in the market right now for my services is irrelevant. I'm trying to expand my network. Now, here's the thing. Out of those 500 people, those that are in the market will naturally expose themselves anyway. Yeah. And because they're referred and endorsed by you, they're going to come in at a higher close ratio, ratio anyway. So the goal here is to realize that that what I want when I'm looking for referrals is I'm really looking for that introduction and endorsement to expand my story into that ideal customer base network. Yeah. Uh, let me give you another example of how a person can do this to solve this problem is we have social media now we have live, right? Another a great way that I execute this technique is if you and I um, did business and I said to you, listen, were you, would you be willing to introduce and endorse me to the people you think would like me? And you said, yeah, I'm in. What do I got to do? I said, we're going to go Facebook Live together. But here's the catch. I'm not going to go live from my account to my network because they already know me. I'm going to go live on your account to your network as an introduction to them. So when I sell something now, the customer is going Facebook Live. The customer is introducing and endorsing me. I'm being interviewed on their account to their network. You see, what, what would be stronger, Brad, if I sold something right now? It, would it be to go live on my page and tell my friends I just sold something or to go live on your fr page and let your friends know you bought something? Yeah. Uh, obviously, right? But salespeople, unfortunately, today don't think this way, uh, haven't asked these questions uh, because they're unfortunately maybe not, not taught to do this. Uh, they're intimidated by the idea of it. But the truth is if you add massive value and you out-experience your competition, you have every right to ask for your client to help you and uh, give them an opportunity to, to expose themselves as, as advocates. There's also um, humor. That's right. Do you think you apply humor? Yeah, I think I think the uh, principle of, of humor or liking is a, is a psychological principle that when we like somebody, when we bond with them, when we have a good time, when you find yourself smiling and laughing, um, you know, obviously it makes you more comfortable and, and makes you feel more like you're willing to try things, right? You're in a more relaxed state at that point, so absolutely. Yeah, because when I went door to door as a kid, six years old, knock on the door, I was selling candy bars. Normal, you know, hey, you want to buy a candy bar? You know, I'd sell one, a mm -hmm. couple times, two. Mm -hmm. Well, then I started getting smart and thought, man, I got to come up with a pitch. So I knock on the door, I hid the candy bars behind my back, and I said, do you have the phone number to a good roof repairman? They'd go, what? Now, keep in mind, this is a six-year-old kid. Right. They'd say, excuse me? And then i say, when you taste one of these, you're going to go through the roof. And, dude, people started buying boxes at a Absolutely. time. Like, oh, that is funny. How much are they? Oh, give me the box, young That's right. man. Oh, honey, come here. Look at this little That's kid. Right. For some reason, just a, a slick little – and it wasn't brilliant. It was funny. Yeah. And it was like, oh, clever. And it came from a kid that you'd never expect it from. But for some reason, that, that skyrocketed sales. How do you think that applies in today's world? I think it always applies because, it's again, it's a very basic principle of psychology that – that w I call it sometimes the Barney effect. You remember Barney the dinosaur? Sure. Right? I love you. You love me. We're a happy family, right? So, uh, you know, the Barney effect is, is a principle in psychology where, where if I feel like I, I like you a lot, I, I want to do things for you because I want to do things for people that I like. But then the reverse also becomes true that if I think that you like me, I also want to do things for you because if you like me i don't want you to stop liking me so i, I want to make sure that i do things for you so you'll keep liking me and then of course you have the the principle of we're alike if i think you and i are are alike similar and familiar to each other then i want to do things for people that i think are similar to me and alike so Humor is a way of bridging that gap and causing somebody to feel that liking and connection in a very quick and easy way. Obviously, some people are better at it than others. Uh, I'll give a shout out right now to a friend of mine, Kenny Brooks. Uh, uh, you just have to go into Google and put in like world's greatest salesman, Kenny Brooks. He was a door-to-door -door salesman selling uh, the Wonder Cleaner. Uh, he had a viral video years back and, and uh, he became a friend of mine a few years um, ago. And th that's probably an example. If you want to watch how somebody integrates humor... Watch that. It's a seven-minute clip. You'll be in stitches. Is that the black dude? Yeah, that dude knocking on doors. Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. It's funny. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a classic example. He goes, oh, my gosh. Who look, did that? Look at that, right? Who did that? Who did that, right? And then he's like, let me let me see if I can part this like Moses part of the Red Sea, and yeah. I'm on a roll like toilet paper, right? Yeah, dude, but that, that right there is called 
practice. Oh my God. You know, the people don't realize that. Like Kenny Brooks has over a thousand one-liner quips like that stored on his phone. And but people don't realize how much time and energy and effort he put into scripting what seems like a off-the-cuff comedy routine is a highly scripted, very well rehearsed, tactical and strategic approach to selling. It looks like a dude's just having fun talking to people. No, this guy's a, this guy's a mad scientist. He's a genius. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is like people would probably go with him to train. Yeah, and you can't learn that unless you sit down and put in the work he put in. Yeah, because even if you know the one-liners, yeah, to deliver them at the right time with yeah. the right tact. Yeah. With, the, with the right customer, because right. I'll bet you you follow him around. He doesn't do that every single door. Right. I bet he adjusts to the person. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you watch it, he actually has several clips like that. And you can see it. And he does adjust the person. But the, the one-liners are still s there. He, how he weaves them in is is based on how the person's responding to him. But no, in general, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a strategic tactician. He knows what he's doing. Is, is he ever in Vegas? Uh, I don't know where he's at now. I think he's in California lately. If he's ever, if he's ever in Vegas, tell him stop by, get I'm gonna, on, drop I'm a, bombs. Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a shout out. I'm gonna tell him tell him to come out here and see you. Yeah, yeah. but that's a perfect example of of weaving in humor. But you know whether whether you elevate your authority to influence somebody, you use the liking principle to influence somebody. I mean, the reality is that all sales is really influence, right? It's really just causing someone to see your perspective and want to follow your advice. And in sales, I think a lot of times what salespeople do is they, they don't operate from that kind of higher empathy. They operate from self-ego, right? They have their perspective on what they want people to believe instead of realizing that I got to start from the customer's perspective. As Tony Robbins says, you know, if you want to influence somebody, find out what already influences them and speak that language to them. In the same way, when, when you're in sales, if you want to master sales, you actually have to suppress your own ego to some degree. That doesn't mean you don't believe in yourself and you don't want to win. It's that when I'm selling somebody, I'm trying to say from the customer's perspective, what is their goals, hopes, dreams, fears? What is their issue, problem that I'm trying to solve? And how do I, from their perspective, speak to them in a way that they see that what I'm offering is what they've been staying up at late at night, praying for, scratching their head, pulling their hair out, trying to figure out how to solve. I am that solution. Um, and it best happens when you f start from the customer perspective. Mm. Folks, I wish we had more time with Jonathan Dawson. I might have you back, or I will have you back if you're ever back in Vegas. He's, he's out here doing a couple keynotes for these uh, dealer groups. If you guys want to follow him, I definitely go to Twitter forward slash, you know, at Cellcology on Twitter. Um, Instagram's at Cellcology. Um, pretty much everything. YouTube's at Cellcology. Yeah, everything's at Cellcology. I like to say I'm all over, this is a Kenny Brooks, I'm all over the web like Spider-Man. You, you can't miss me if you're looking for me. So no, just throw Cellcology into Google. You'll find a bunch of my videos. I'm one of the few trainers out there that literally still practices what I preach. I've got tons of videos of me with clients and customers uh, demonstrating what I teach. Um, and uh, showing it folks showing yeah. it so again you know that's why i'm glad I'm, i have him on if i ever do one of these events you guys pay attention because if i ever say you know this is one of the hand-picked events i think i'm going to call it hand-picked and it's, i'm just going to bring people that like i would listen to i would learn from and and why it's again i know what he's saying and i can agree i don't disagree with any of it but the words he's talking about the the way he's talking about the way he presents it is years of studying so i don't have to and again i'm still going to study but but again i mean dude the psychology aspect of sales will take you from good to really good and 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 maybe even spark off a whole nother career mm. like sales i yeah. mean it's like training yeah because dude it's it's um, it's it's almost like an art if you really think about it like, like to, to, to execute these things, you know? it's art and science. The it, science it, it part is. is the, is the part that can easily be studied, duplicated, that can be broken down into principles, patterns, and processes. The art is the finesse of your personality. It's weaving in your own temperament. It's being still authentically you. I, I, in psychology, I tell my students all the time, the goal is not for you to become me. It's just for you to be, pay attention. And, and become the smarter version of yourself. It's to, it's to not change who you fundamentally are. It's to, take advantage of who you fundamentally are and, and solve the problem. It's, I, I agree. It's art and science. And not to mention, it's a lot of practice folks. So again, you're not going to, yeah. you know, I you hit replay a thousand times, go over what we just said, and you will learn a lot more than you just did by listening to it once. The best way to learn though, is go in and 
study with the gentleman, whether it's in person, which is a little bit more costly. Um, if you're a business owner, you'd want him to come out to your business, go to sellcology.com. But if, uh, if you're an individual and you want to learn how to master sales, man, I'd follow him because you're putting out this content for free. I left put out and right. tons of content. I'm, uh, if my, my Facebook page is public, you can find me uh, again on Facebook, Jonathan Dawson or Psychology. Uh, if you're in automotive specifically, because that's again my primary niche. If you're in automotive specifically, I have a private, uh, a automotive only s s uh, group on Facebook called Psychology Automotive Sales and Ma uh, Marketing Group. So I have resources like that, but I t put out tons of free content. Again, you know, I'm always giving. Well, I appreciate you taking the time coming in here. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Folks, go follow Jonathan. Go uh, rate and review this podcast and always keep it real.